So first, let me, of course, thank the organizers, thank Giliola, for the tremendous honor of speaking at this conference. As I could describe my entire experience at Princeton as a postdoc, it's amazing and intimidating all at the same time. It's the same coming back for this meeting. Now, we've heard many very eloquent descriptions of what it's like to work with Jean, Larry Guth, Demeter, um, Kantorovich, they all spoke beautifully about that. But one of the things I learned about Jean is he thinks amazingly, first of all, but he also likes to think in pictures. So how do you express working with Jean in a picture, which he would like? So I think I found a solution to this some years ago. I'm proud to say, so let me show you. This is the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so when I put up this picture on my webpage, I got a phone call from a friend. He said, you have beautiful eyes. <laughs> So it doesn't end there because then I get students and postdocs who come and ask me, why do you have a jackass on your web page? What, <laughs> what do you say to that? So I taught honors analysis this past winter quarter, and my students presented me with this. <laughs> so if this tradition continues, I will have a zoo of these animals in my office. <laughs> All right. Um, let me see if I can maximize this. So it was wonderful to have Svetlana introduce this entire field. It makes my life so much easier. This is a page turner. So she already introduced these operators, which have their origins in the very early days of quantum mechanics. So they are supposed to, as far as I understand, model crystals in physics and Bloch in the 20s, I think he also got a Nobel Prize for this, understood that if you put a periodic potential here, then you have absolutely continuous spectrum. This is like the behavior of an electron. After all, a metal is an electric conductor, so you don't expect to have eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. But what amazed everybody in the 50s, and it earned him a Nobel Prize, was Anderson here in Princeton in the physics department who showed that in nature, after all, you should have random impurities in your crystal. If you add those, and if the disorder is large enough, then a conductor will turn into an insulator. So Svetlana told this quite amazing story. There is the famous work of Furley Spence on the one hand in the random case who proved that this is the case for large disorder. There is still the famous open problem of small disorder that you have some so-called extended states, the presence of absolutely continuous spectrum. This is, has remained open all these years. In the quasi-periodic case that Svetlana presented, it was Sinai in his Moscow seminar, who's here with us today, who really um, focused his attention on the quasi-periodic models and started that with his work with Dina, with Dina Burg. And so here on this slide, I will move quite quickly because many slides. Um, no, that was too quick. <laughs> so you take a potential like Svetlana had, she called this X a phase variable, so we will use this terminology anyway. I hope I have it on these slides. And in great generality, you can say that the spectrum is a fixed set, almost surely, and this follows easily from the ergodic theorem. You can also prove that the Lebesgue decomposition of the spectral measure, which corresponds to the decomposition of the spectrum into absolutely continuous pure point and singular continuous, that these are deterministic. The eigenvalues themselves are not deterministic. They're highly sensitive to the phase. But the closure of the eigenvalues is not um, random. That is deterministic. And Anderson localization means precisely that the spectrum is purely consists of eigenvalues and that moreover the eigenfunctions, like in a compact self adjoint operator, but you're very far from the compact case here, obviously, that you have a basis of L2 and that they, exp uh, that they decay exponentially. So the first few slides 
will now present this famous Bugger Goldstein theorem that Avila credits, for example, for getting him into this field. So the mechanism is as follows you have, after all, a one dimensional operator. So this is an ODE, a discrete, the equation one is a discrete ODE, and you rewrite the second order problem as a first order two by two system, as we teach our undergraduates. And then there is this matrix A that gives rise to the Coase cycle. There's the propagator MN, which here in the discrete case is very nicely written just as this product of N of these factors of these matrices A, but they of course shifted along an orbit, so Tx, T squared, X, Tnx. The Lapunov exponent which Svetlana had in her presentation is defined here. It's the expected value normalized of the logarithm of the monodromy, expected rel value relative to x. And then um, there is the famous Fürstenberg-Keston theorem that says that, well, the almost everywhere limit exists. It's relatively easy. By the way, I'm about to say trivial. Let me tell you another story. So when I was a young student in Vienna, Schachermeyer taught me a very nice course in functional analysis and Bourguin's name was, he had his name on his lips with trepidation, so with great respect. And then there were young people who said, I really want to meet Jean Bourguin at EHS. I hear he says everything is trivial. Okay, so um, this is relatively trivial that these averages converge, less trivial, again, that's Fürstenberg, Kesten, or Kingman's sub additive ergodic theorem that these limits exist almost everywhere. All right. So then, how would you establish this Anderson localization? Well, you might refer to the oscillated theorem, which came out of Sinai's seminar in Moscow, that you have a filtration of directions. What this means is that. You can find x-dependent vectors depending on the phase, such that if you apply these matrices to that direction, they will give you, so this here is written in the contracting, of course, way, because the contracting direction is unique. The ex expanding is non-unique. And then, let me go to this picture. You may say, well, the endless local should be easy, should be trivial, modulo, of course, the non-trivial oscillated theorem and the sub-additive ergodic theorem. You just do the following, sorry. You, you go to the right, you use the oscillated direction to the right, you use the oscillated direction to the left, and if you have a kink, you know the solution. If they are linearly dependent, they ma you can match them up smoothly and then they decay if the Laponov exponent, of course, is positive, which you need, then you have exponential decay at both ends. So why, why is it not as easy as that? Well, the fallacy in this is written here that in oscillated theorem, you have to remove a set of measure zero, but that set of measure zero depends on your E. So if you're doing this for a continuum of E's, you will remove possibly all of the phases, the entire space of X that's not allowed. So localization is not as simple as that. It's not as simple as this picture. And so here is the theorem that Svetlana referenced. And to avoid this catastrophic removal of too many phases, which you would run into by just naively applying oscillators, you have to play a game of resonances. So this is a phrase that I learned from Sinai in his, not Moscow seminar, his Princeton seminar. Sinai always insisted that, um, and Sinai himself credits Phil Anderson for this, that you have to understand resonances. What we mean by a resonance will become clearer in the next slides. So here is that theorem. It says, take this one periodic discrete Schrodinger operator on the line, take a trigonometric polynomial, you can take analytic, you, I think you call this a sample function V, right? You evaluate this, you get a potential by evaluating the sample function along the orbit of a shift on the circle and then for almost every omega, we can call omega the rotation number, 
you have Anderson localization, provided, of course, that the Lapunov exponent is positive and you kind of need here for all E and omega. So a few comments here. This is, was preceded by the this s similar kind of theorem, but stronger. So Sh Svetlana proved this for all the Fanta and omega for the cosine sample function for the almost Mathieu or Harper operator. <coughs> Notice in the previous theorem that actually if you still remember what H index X is, so H0 is the one where you freeze the phase at a particular starting point. You can vary that starting point and by Fubini it's easy, you just get this for almost every omega and X. And it's not as simple in that theorem to just hope to prove it for almost every omega, I'm sorry, for the Fanta in omega. You somehow need to remove more in order to precisely preclude double resonances. And this type, this result extends also to multiple frequencies. That's in their paper. You don't have to stick to the one-dimensional torus. You can take higher dimensional tori too and you retain the statement. So how does this work? Even though I have to be a bit careful in time, I will try and say a few things about this. So remember the Lapunov exponent is the expected value of the normalized logarithmic growth rate. So here, sorry, here is this log of the norm of the propagator independence of E omega, it also depends on omega that's suppressed here in the notation, but it's there. And you want to measure the deviations, like in probability theory, it's natural to study the deviation from the mean. And so you have a very useful theorem here that algebraic polynomial deviations happen only on exponentially small sets. So there is an exponential gain and that exponent comes from the log. But it's not as immediate as that. You should think of this more in just a, how would you prove a simple ergodic theorem? You take a C2 function in the circle, you average over a shift over the Ophantan rotation of length n, how would you do this to prove an ergodic theorem? Well, you expand in Fourier series, and you will see that, right, as long as you have a Diophantan assumption, you control the small denominators, and the decay of the Fourier coefficients you get from assuming that your sample function um, is smooth enough. Well, here, you try to do exactly the same thing, and there are two ingredients that you need to use. These are not just any functions, they're subharmonic functions. So a smooth subharmonic function has the property that it's Laplacian, it's non-negative, but these are not smooth functions. But they retain this property. But the Laplacian is not a function, it's a positive measure. This is called the Reese representation theorem. So up to a harmonic piece, your subharmonic function is a logarithmic potential, e of x is e to the two pi i x, that's on the circle, plus a harmonic piece. So you need that, that replaces what I just said before. If you take a C2 function of the circle, you average, you get a, a Godic theorem. You don't have C2, you have something much rougher. But still, because the logarithm is the Hilbert transform of an interval, essentially, the Fourier transform of an interval decays like one over n. Hilbert transform doesn't change the size of the decay, so you get one over n decay of the Fourier coefficients for that. That's not summable, but you can still do something. And where this is not manifestly the average over a shift, but of course you have to use, very crucially, this almost invariance, because these MNs are product of shifted matrices. Once you shift the whole product, you have a huge overlap. Only the Ns change. So in L infinity, U remains very close to its shifted function. And these two allow you to, for example, use a Fourier proof. There are other proofs. Now, to show you a picture of what such a function would look like, this is what it would look like for the almost Mathieu operator that Svetlana had on her slide, this cosine potential. You see that you can have all of these exceptional points where you can become very large and negative, but you don't strike out in the positive direction, not surprisingly. And what does the large deviation theorem do? It measures the size 
of, if you want, the projection onto this axis of these spikes. So then, coming back to this philosophy, Anders' localization is a game of resonances. What is, it, what is a resonance? To understand that, we introduce what Svetlana also had, the Green's function, or the Green function it is simply the inverse of H minus E. So this notation here, H lambda, means you take your ODE, your discrete ODE, you restrict it to an interval on the lattice lambda, you impose directly boundary conditions, that is H lambda. So you get a self-adjoint matrix, and what could be easier than to invert it? Well, not so easy. First of all, you have to stay away from the eigenvalues of this. That's precisely this type of condition. And what's important here is not so much the details of what B1 is, but that you don't have exponential. You don't have e to the length of the interval. You have e to the length of the interval to a power less than one. That is simply a separation from the spectrum. Second condition is you want exponential decay away from the diagonal for this matrix. Where does this come from? Well, there are a number of ways of seeing this. Why would you even expect such a property? If you first make the extremely radical assumption that your potential is so large that you can ignore the Laplacian. So you do something seemingly silly. You just look at the multiplication operator, which is purely diagonal, which multiplies the vector psi just by the potential at the site n. So psi n goes to v n psi n. That is purely diagonal. And that simply means then that your energy stays away from the values of the potential in this controlled fashion. And this is automatic because if you invert it, you have zero of diagonal, all right? So this radical step of assuming that the potential is so huge that it kills Laplacian is of course naive, but it can be made to work. And this is exactly what Sinai started from in his statistical physics paper from the 90s where he established localization by a KAM scheme, as Svetlana mentioned. You start from delta function, eigenfunctions at lattice side, assuming that your disorder is huge, the lambda in front of the potential, and then you have to bring in the Laplacian at the next step and all further steps. But here we're not doing this. We're not taking, in the Burger goldstein theorem, you're not taking the disorder huge. You have to work with these non-K methods and what replaces huge disorder is the assumption that the Lapunov exponent is positive. All right, so another way to see this, which is a bit less naive than to just turn off the Laplacian, is to assume that you have Anderson localization and meaning a basis of exponentially decaying orthogonal eigenfunctions. Then you simply separate your energy from the spectrum, and then you can express this in the basis of the eigenfunctions, you get that. And because they're perpendicular and exponentially decaying by a uniform rate, of course, you can then just estimate this brutally and you will recover this exponential off-diagonal decay. So, again, I have to be a bit careful with time. The entire strategy in the burger goldstein theorem is as follows. You take any number E, you assume it's in the spectrum. That gives you a priori information. If you're not in the spectrum, you don't have to worry. If you're in the spectrum, then it's natural and substantiated by the so-called Schnoll-Simon theorem that you have a generalized eigenfunction which decays at most linearly, polynomially, linearly, okay? In N, in the position on the lattice. So then you find a big window around the origin on the lattice which, for which the Hamiltonian, this is your truncated ODE with theory con condition, recognizes that your generalized eigenfunction is almost an eigenfunction on that finite scale. This is this here. But then once you have this one window, you have to make sure that you have exponential decay off of there, not keep finding more such windows where you have big bumps. You have to really then show that you have exponential decay away from there. And what this means is that you found near the origin a huge window which for which the Green's function, according to the previous slide, is resonance, bad if you want, resonant. So then you have to show that if you take 
windows sufficiently separated from that scale that all of these green functions are good and give you exponential decay. And that's the problem of double resonances, the game of resonances, all right? And the way to do this technically is you use the resolvent identity to patch up smaller scales to bigger scales, which you can do if you never run into a problem. This is also essential in the multi-scale analysis that Svetlana mentioned, the famous Fehrlich Spencer technique. But here we have highly dependent potentials. The whole randomness sits in the one phase variable, x. And this type of philosophy that started really with this Bogan Goldstein paper has been implemented in a number of settings that I will, some of which I will mention others. Not the skew shift, John was very enamored with the skew shift around 2000. There are still open problems on the skew shift, right? So it's hard. Why is it hard? Because unlike the models we've discussed so far where you have a shift just by n, so you shift by omega 2, omega 3, omega, if you take the skew shift, you run into n squared omega. This is one of the things that I remember from my time here as postdoc. Peter Sarnock is very excited about n squared omega and these disputes about Poisson behavior of fractional parts of n squared omega. So there are many mysteries involving n squared omega still. And so in a picture, again, Jean likes to think in terms not just donkey pictures, that's me as of it. Um, how does localization work? Well, you take your generalized eigenfunction, it may grow just by very soft, naive principles, but then you have to make sure that if you have a resonant window, all of these windows are non-resonant, and that will give you exponential decay. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you exclude double resonances, or even, it's very important also to sometimes consider multiple resonances. Two are not enough for many applications. I will get to that at the very end if I have time. This is precisely what you see in the problem of multiple frequencies. So there is, Joe introduced this um, semi-algebraic sets into this game. There is a bounded complexity to what the bad sets can look like. And to formalize this notion, you introduce a semi-algebraic set. You take a polynomial in n variables, you look at level sets. That's the simplest semi-algebraic set, but then you want to be stable under intersections and unions. So you create these type, types of words where these sigmas are from this alphabet. <coughs> and of course, once you have this alphabet and these operations, you can put others in here, greater, equal, less, or equal. All right? And so that is a semi-algebraic set. And there is an, a number of beautiful properties that these sets have. They cannot be too bad. They can be extremely complicated, but still they're controllably complicated. And the way to quantify what it means to be controllably complicated is you introduce the notion of a degree of a semi-algebraic set, not surprisingly. you take into account the degree d of the individual polynomials. And coming back to the definition here, you can ignore the union as it turns out, but of course not the number of polynomials you have. So SD would be your bound on the complexity of your semi-algebraic set. The famous seidenberg tarski theorem says, for example, that the projection of semi-algebraic sets is itself semi-algebraic. So, um, a quantitative version of this fact, purely qualitative, semi-algebraic, you project, you get semi-algebraic. <coughs> I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. So now, how do we make this quantitative? And there is a theorem here that's very important in this game, is that you can control the complexity, the degree of a projection of a semi-algebraic set in terms of a polynomial of the degree of your original set. And there is a, an expert um, on semi-algebraic sets at Purdue, I believe now, so Sogata Basu. A beautiful book on this entire subject. Unfortunately, it's like six or seven hundred pages long, so it's relatively what did John said? It looks non-trivial. <laughs> it looks relatively non-trivial, yes. Entirely it's not entirely trivial, yes. Indeed. 
So what do semi-algebraic sets have to do with anything as far as localization is concerned? It's easy to see that it's relevant. If you take such a level set, these are precisely the type of level sets that appear in the large deviation theorems. This would mean that you deviate too much in the wrong direction, into the minus infinity direction, if you will. Um, then you replace very quickly, you replace the norm here by the hilbert schmidt norm. It turns out that the entries of these products of propagator ma matrices are special. They are determinants of self-adjoint operators, namely various truncations of your operator on the line to windows, okay? And so these are the F1 through F4. So these are controllable polynomial type objects. They are determinants. Um, then they are trigonom if you start from a trigonometric polynomial, you have a polynomial in cosine sine. That sounds messy because cosine sine are actually analytic and not algebraic. But you get around that, for example, just by saying cosine is x1, sine is x2, and then you're on the circle, x1 squared plus x2 squared is 1. That's everything is algebraic. So you can completely express such an object as a semi-algebraic set roughly of degree n. Okay. And so then how do you remove double resonances? This is a picture I remember extremely well when I, I was around when the, here, when the Burg and Goldstein paper came around. And so these are the type of pictures by which these double resonances were excluded. So what is going on here? This weekly set is what kind of set? So remember that we want to exclude double resonances. So what does that mean? Is you have the failure of the large deviation estimate at some window, and imagine you had the failure of the large deviation estimate at some other window, translated, for example. But this is at a fixed energy. And remember what went wrong in oscillated. So you cannot take the union of all energies. But now you have a fixed energy. You have two sets that depend on the energy. However, since you have these two windows, the energy is discretized. Basically, the energy has to be one of the eigenvalues of the first matrix. And then so you have everything under control. In this way, you eliminate E from the picture. But you still have a bad set. You have a bad set, and this is the bad set, and you have to avoid double resonances. What does this mean? It means that omega is the rotation number, x is the phase, but x is now translated by a multiple of omega. So you have to make sure that omega L omega does not fall into Sn. This is precisely the way of thinking in the Bugan goldstein paper. And what does a line look like on the torus? It looks like this. Your bad set looks like that. And this is the omega axis. This would be the x axis. X is precisely this L omega. And so now what you have to make sure is you have to make sure that you want to eliminate only a very small set of omega with the property that you fall in there, all right? So clearly there is an enemy that you face. Imagine that your, your wiggly set, these sausages here, were entirely centered around your line. If they're delta tubes around the line, you would be ending up with every omega as you project down here onto that axis. That's a catastrophe. You would have nothing to go on. However, you c your bad set cannot look like a union of steep lines because of semi-algebraic property. The horizontal intersections consist only of n to the c many intervals where n is appropriately chosen. So here is the lemma from the Burgon Goldstein paper. It's a very neat, like many magical things that uh, Jean is responsible for, so many magical things. This is, looks very simple. Proof is also simple, but just coming up with that this is really the relevance, relevant statement here is remarkable. So take, um, a set, you have m, at most m intervals when you take horizontal intersections, the measure is under control. Then you have an estimate on the number of times relative to omega that you can visit this by omega L omega. And I don't want to bore you with too many details. You, these parameters are all adjusted to the various scales that you have in the problem. You have to keep track of this. It's, you have to work. 
All right, so this was the entire, of course, a snapshot only of the um, Wolfgang Goldstein paper. Then that was for endless localization, but there is the opposite property that Svetlana also mentioned when you have absolutely continuous spectrum, and Bogun and Svetlana established that for small disorder, but of course this story has, this was 14 years ago, so it has unfolded in dramatic ways, not just through the work of Svetlana with Avila, but also Avila by himself, this reducibility theory that he developed for zero Laponov exponents, all right? So I don't want to get too much into that. Um, one thing that Michael and I did some years ago, many years ago, 99, is we wanted, that's how I got into this business, we wanted to know about the rate of convergence, which actually is very relevant even for localization, the rate of convergence of the Laponov exponent in finite volume, Ln, to the one in infinite volume. And so there is a device that carries the name of avalanche principle that allows you inductively to control the size of the norm of a long product of matrices in terms of the norms of the factors. Now this might be completely impossible because you could have something like this. Each factor can be huge, A, A minus, but the whole product amounts to the identity. You have nothing in your hand. So this already shows you have to have a mechanism that controls pairwise cancellations, but to some extent, that is the only obstruction you face. Provided each factor is large enough in norm, all you have to exclude is pairwise cancellation. And this is summarized in this type of clean statement. If you just take every norm greater to equal mu, if what this is, it controls the ratio of norm of product of neighboring matrices over the product of the norms, all right? So this is under control relative to that. Then you have this type of statement. So you can make a estimate on the norm of the product versus this type of thing. And proof is easy. You look at singular value decomposition. You look at the most expanding directions and this pairwise cancellation um, obstruction, so this obstructs pairwise cancellation, makes sure that the image of your expanding direction of A1 doesn't align with the, contra with the contracting direction of A2, etc. So then you have a binary tree and one leaf dominates, right? That is the avalanche principle. So then if you combine this avalanche principle, this was an observation Michael and I made years ago, so if you combine the avalanche principle with a large deviation estimate, you average it, you get this kind of relation on a bunch of finite volume Laponov exponents. So L to N relates to LK, where K is logarithmic in N. The same relation holds for N instead of 2N. You use triangle inequality, you end up with this. If you work a little bit more, you can even get rid of the logarithmic um, loss here. So Ln minus L decays at the rate 1 over N. What's written down here is that this is sharp unless you have actually exponential decay. So either exponential or that. And Svetlana mentioned the integrated density of states. What is that? It's the limiting distribution of the eigenvalues. That is a deterministic object, it's some measure, and you want to know how regular the distribution function is, that turns out to be Holder continuous. So the, the Laponov exponent, which is the, the Hilbert transform of the integrated density of states, that is Holder continuous in the energy, as well as in the frequency omega, so provided you're Diophantin. So, um, Svetlana explained these things. Then back years again when um, we, I gave a lecture at the Institute, Peter Cernak immediately wanted to know, so what happens to the avalanche principle when you have n by n matrices, not two by two, what I showed you was just two by two. So at the time, we didn't have an application for this, we didn't pursue it, shame on us. Then I got asked this question more and in 2012, I wrote a little paper. It's a simple generalization of what we had in the two by two. If you take here, it's a D by D co-cycle. That's the definition of a co-cycle in vertible matrices, and it depends continuously on a parameter. It's just abstractly on a metric space. If you make sure that your Laponov exponents are all distinct, so this is called simple Laponov spectrum. I think some people use this terminology. If you have a simple Laponov spectrum, 
then you can see that you retain the property that all of the Lapunov exponents depend holder continuously on this parameter e, this abstract parameter e. But I needed to, I needed to strongly assume this separation of the Lapunov exponents, a strong assumption. Now I'm happy to say that other people have done much better. So I have Brazilians in the audience, I don't dare to pronounce this. Whenever I try, they correct me, so I won't try. Um, Silvius Klein, former student of Christoph Thiele, UCLA. So they worked much harder than I did, did much better, and developed an entire theory, beautiful theory, not easy, where they have to allow for coalescing Laponov exponents, the expanding directions are not unique anymore. You have planes instead of lines, so you have to really non-trivially work in the space of planes, the Grassmann manifold, and this came out just a few weeks ago, so please rush and buy it. <laughs> so then, this philosophy of Goldstein and Burger Goldstein, sorry, was generalized in a number of directions. For example, for PDEs, when you don't have an OD on the line, but you have a PDE in higher dimensions. Where are my time controllers? Who controls? 15 minutes, okay, okay thank you. Okay, th so Jean was very interested in this and you take a Laplacian, in this case on Z2, you take a potential, non-random, but given by an ergodic process, but now you have two phase variables and you have two dynamics going on, namely shift omega one in one coordinate, shift by omega two in the other coordinate. And then you can say that if you have a real analytic function and you have to make sure that because of this geometry of translations in these horizontal vertical directions that you're not constant in these directions, here there is no Laponov exponent. You don't have a product of matrices. So how do you formulate a positive Laponov exponent? Well, you can't really do this, but you can say that you settle for assuming that this lambda is big. And sure enough, this is what that theorem says, but you have to remove, and this is necessary, cannot say for almost every, you have to re allow for the loss of a small set of omegas, that's this set F epsilon, and the lambda, the disorder, will depend on that epsilon, otherwise you could remove it. So you, you have that, and then you have Anderson localization again. And so I don't, perhaps want to spend too much time on the details of this. But again, it's a game of resonances. So you have again the, a box, you have no transfer matrices, but you look at boxes, in fact, slightly more general regions, which we call elementary regions. What that is not so important. For example, the difference of two boxes you have to allow for in this game. And you again have your separation from the spectrum condition, your exponential decay. And in the proof of endless localization, there is again the semi-algebraic machinery that you need in order to eliminate double resonances. But crucially, you need an analog of the large deviation estimate. So in the matrix case, when you had an ODE with transfer matrices, you prove this large devi deviation estimate without eliminating anything, all right? It was proved a priorily. You don't even need to assume positive Laponov exponents in that case. But here things are different, and this is proved really through a KM procedure. And so now you cannot use Fourier series. What saves the day? There is something that I remember when I first met Michael here. He, Michael Goldstein, he was insisting on the importance of these Carton estimates. This is a simple tool from potential theory, and Michael was absolutely right. These Carton estimates have been indispensable. So take a logarithmic potential with a positive finite measure and then you want to control exactly like in the large deviation estimate. You want to control the set where u is near minus infinity. All right? How bad can this be? And so I hope I'm not going to glaze your eyes over here with these details but you can find a countable collection of disks whose radii raised to the epsilon 
So the important thing is that epsilon is not just two, you can take it to be two, but take it small, okay? The point of putting an epsilon there is because if you just look at this statement, it will imply that, for example, the set where such a logarithmic potential can take the value minus infinity has house of dimension zero, okay? We don't need that here, but it implies it. And then you control the values of u from below in terms of the so-called Reese mass, Reese representation, right? <coughs> so the measure, the total measure of mu, as long as you stay outside of these disks. And this applies even to the polynomial. It's, that's perhaps the most representative case. When you take a polynomial and log of the absolute value of the polynomial. And there are two examples that are at opposite ends, extreme ends. If the Reese mass sits at one point and has mass n, or if that Reese mass is evenly distributed around the circle. In the this is a bad case. You have no large deviation as to whatsoever. This is a number, then you get some other number. There is no improvement in terms of n. But crucially, when you have much more regular distribution of this Reese mass, you have a huge gain, like you have in the large deviation estimate. So clearly, this is more representative analytically for what we want. But in and of itself, this doesn't help you much for the Anders localization on the Z2 lattice. So again, this, I don't mean to glaze your eyes over, this is in Bougain's book that Lana mentioned prominently, the Princeton book from 2005, the orange book. This is matrix-valued Cartan's theorem. And this, I remember, Jean was very excited about this and claimed in his talk at the Institute, you can prove everything with this. So <laughs> what does it mean you can prove everything with this? So it's what he had in mind were in particular his construction of quasi periodic solutions to NLS and nonlinear wave equations. He revisited that topic, that's the, the very end of his book. And with this tool, you can simplify these KM constructions that he did. So what it is, is you have an, it's an abstract theorem, if you will. You have an n by n matrix that depends analytically on Z in some disk. And it is Hermitian for real X. And then you assume you have these parameters B1. Not surprisingly, you want an a priori control on the size of the norm. Then very crucially, R here, I didn't define R, I will do so on the slide, I'll tell you what it is. It's just a restriction operator. So you restrict a vector by setting it zero outside of lambda complement, which means on lambda you will set it equal to zero. And you assume a priori an invertibility for that, okay? And then you have something like ultimately you want but of a very weak form, I mean that you can say that you are invertible with a control on the norm for perhaps 1% of the set. This you can imagine as 1%. And then you have something much, much stronger than 1%. You can bootstrap this by means of these analytical tools of Carton estimate to actually get um, an exponential control on the tails. These are your level sets, and you have this very favorable estimate. So this is precisely the tool that allows you to go from one scale to the next scale without losing the, the exponential here. You need some type of exponential control. So what is the hardest condition to check? I, I'm a bit hard-pressed on time, so how do you even do such a thing? Well, you have to use the Feshbach formula, right? You have a big n by n matrix, but you break it into four blocks, a, b, c, d. It's an old thing. You assume that, say, a is invertible, then the whole thing is invertible if the so-called Feshbach determinant is invertible, and you have quantitative, it's all explicit quantitative control on the norms. Which of these conditions is the hardest to check in your putative applications to KM? Most likely, it will be this one here, okay? This you get fairly softly from the previous scale, from the large deviation estimate at the small scale, you pave your big scale, you assume everything is good inside, but that happens only rarely, whereas here you want something to hold on opposite, 99.9%, .9%, not 1%. 
So this, this will be the big potato for you to check. And it was for us too. And in fact, number theory came into that. Of what kind? So you have a semi-algebraic set, and you look for these strange orbits, n1 omega 1, n2 omega 2, falling into that thin set. And because of this type of picture, here you pave, this is like in multi-scale Froelich Spencer analysis, okay? So you have, this is a so-called elementary region, difference between two boxes. You can just take it to be a cube. You don't lose any understanding. Take a cube and try to go from this point to say that point. Here is x, here is y. And if you could find a chain, you have to allow for any possible path connecting x to y. If there exists one such chain that is entirely made up of resonant bad boxes, you can do nothing, okay? So you have to make sure that you never find such a long chain. The only way to exclude it is if the bad boxes are sparse, if the resonances are fairly sparse. So what this means specifically, you have to make sure that the number of resonances, which is given precisely by the count of this set, is sublinear in N. And since this is one dimensional, you have a chance of doing this because you would expect this to be linear in N1. And so the game now then becomes to beat this. And one can do that here. I d again, I don't want to bore you with this. There is a way, this is what you should pay attention to. The N to a number less than one. And here is your semi-algebraic set. If too many of these points, everything is mod Z2, if too many of the points N1, omega 1, N2, omega 2 were to come too close to this curve, which can be neither horizontal nor vertical, obviously, that's a condition in the lemma, then you get a, a, condi a condition that you can exclude. You have to throw away a set of omega 1, omega 2. But, so I will zip forward. This is... Um, we are now in higher dimensions, okay? So that's d great equal three. I skipped too many slides. So, but we were stuck in this paper with dimension two. We didn't know what to do in higher dimensions because you have a bad set, it will have dimension two. That means generically you would visit it n squared times, but you would have to beat this to sublinear because nothing changes. And so I remember how stuck we were and John didn't know what to do, but a couple of years later, not surprisingly, he just solved this. And he came up with a completely different, so this picture completely goes out in dimension higher than two. And so he came up, what am I doing here? He came up with a completely different, as a Gaffer paper, completely different approach in which there's no number theory and he does he brings in semi-algebraic sets from the beginning to eliminate variables, right? And remarkably, what he manages to do is to eliminate a set of omegas that depends on the potential. In the number theory, the omegas did not depend on the potential. They're just eliminated by looking at greatest common divisors and the like. Here, you eliminate from the get-go independence on the sample function. And the price you pay is, amongst others, that you have bad control on the size of your box that you have to work on. You know that within a big window there is a scale that is good and then all resonances sit in a small um, center in the middle. So here is his localization theorem. It reads just like the other one. And his elimination procedure is reminiscent of Bezu's theorem. In order to eliminate one variable, you double the number of variables, okay? so. If you have a semi-algebraic set, you have to make sure that you don't, it's not horizontal, it's far from horizontal. Then you look at pairs x1, x2 such that there exists the other variable that makes you fall into the set. And then think of these conditions as polynomial x1, t is zero, polynomial x2, t is zero. If you're not degenerate in t, you can eliminate, all right? And the non-degeneracy in t is precisely this non-horizontal non condition. And then he gets, that's easy that it's semi-algebraic, that's the quantitative Seidenberg-Tarski theorem, and you work a little bit and you get that the measure is under control. And if you want to eliminate two t's, t and s, you cannot get away with doubling, you have to quadruple, you have four. With three, you need eight, etc. And so this gets a little bit expensive, but at the end, what he does is you have a large-scale cube and you want to confine the resonances. Then you first do it in, 
this vertical horizontal and so on, in the end you confine it to a small sublinear cube in the middle and you have excluded long resonance. So let me in the last two, three minutes, if I'm allowed, get to the new results. Localization was known multi-frequency, <laughs> but there is this Cholayevsky um, Sinai conjecture from around 1988, there was CMP paper on this topic, where they conjecture, and this is language that is directly taken from Sinai's work, um, on forbidden zones. So Svetlana mentioned that she and Avila famously solved the 10 Martini problem. This is the Cantor structure of the spectrum for the almost mature operator. All right? For all irrational rotations, Pooch before had done Diophanta, and it's a big deal to go from Diophanta into all irrationals. So Sinai had already obtained, but perturbatively via KM scheme, gaps in the spectrum via forbidden zones. And his philosophy can be expressed as follows. Imagine that you have a determinant like this, you compute its eigenvalues. If epsilon is zero, then you might have a double eigenvalue. You might have this. But if epsilon is positive, you get that. What this means is very simple. It means that for a Dirichlet problem here, we just have two points. But for a Dirichlet problem, the eigenvalues are always simple. Right? So they, you can't have a coalescing eigenvalues for a Dirichlet problem. And in Sinai's statistical physics paper, he draws all of this in, the f in, in forms of a picture. So you have your potential, and at least at the very first initial step of KM, you take your potential, you translate it against itself, and if that translation is by integer multiples of omega, and you pick an energy exactly at that height, the right height, then because of the previous quadratic solution that we had, you would have to form these forbidden zones. And they open up both here and there. So then the spectrum will miss this interval. Now, of course, you can say it could be filled in at later stages because that's the first stage. Well, you have to control all of this. It's complicated. Um, but Cholayevsky and I argued that because in t for two frequencies, you wouldn't have just curves that you intersect with themselves. You have surfaces. Imagine a paraboloid. You shift it against itself. You intersect along a curve. Generically, for generic potentials, such a curve will not be horizontal. If it's not horizontal, you will not open up a forbidden zone. It will always be covered by sections of the graph that are not affected by this resonance. And so this is a beautiful idea, but coming back to the one-dimensional context, so there is the avila jetimirskaya theorem for the almost Mathieu, Goldstein and I, um, we looked at potentials that are not cosine. So we took analytic potentials, positive Laponov exponents, and we proved that you can actually use non-perturbatively, however. So this picture in and of itself just applied to the potential doesn't get you far non-perturbatively, but you can replace it by the graphs of the eigenvalues. And then we worked a little bit 250 pages over two papers. <laughs> but next to general relativity, that's nothing, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, then we showed that indeed you get a Cantor structure, but it, the result is weaker than for almost Mathieu than Avila Zhitomirska because we don't do this for irrational mega. We don't even do it for Diophanta. And once again, we have to exclude resonances, in this case, triple resonances, and so we, for almost every omega. Okay, we can be more precise in terms of how stuff dimension, but never mind. But for multiple frequencies, not only do you not have a Cantor spectrum, conjecturally, but you lose the analytical tools. You lose a sharp large deviation estimate. I cannot go into these 250 pages, forgive me, but just believe me that our toys go out the window. Okay, so, however, over the last year we've been working hard on that and our realization was that even though we are sobbing because our tools break down and we cannot even know how to start, if you take Bourguin's semi-algebraic elimination, 
from his 2007 GAFA paper and you combine it with our results from the gap, then there is a chance, okay? And so we are working towards a proof of Chilevsky Senai. Forgive me that I don't, I cannot say the paper is finished. We're in the, mm, not quite in the middle, maybe to the right of the middle of this. Some parts are clean and completely worked out. And what's completely worked out is this finite volume localization and separation of the eigenvalues. You need, you cannot have this for, for the entire graph of the eigenvalues parameterized by the phase, but for much of it, you have good control on the separation. So just to give you a flavor of these results, close your eyes if you're not in the field. Um, so imagine, so what, in words, you remove a small set of omegas, then you, depending on what, which o little omega you pick, say take d equals two, this multi-frequency, but still the Schrodinger operator is on the line, of course. So you have avalanche principle, you have transfer matrix and so on, but you have to struggle with the fact that the orbits of higher dimensional shifts are much worse behaved. So then you remove a set of phases so that the eigenfunctions of these matrices in finite volume are localized. That's what this says. And you can try and unravel what all of these quantitative things mean, never mind. But very important, without that you cannot even attack with our methods, maybe there are other methods, but the Cholayevsky Senai conjecture is you have a separation of the eigenvalues in finite volume. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>